this morning to worship the Lord, really to rejoice before the Lord in song, in reading and reflection, and I hope that we can keep that same attitude of worshiping and rejoicing, even as we read His Word now. So, if you have a Bible, let's open up to 1 Samuel chapter 11, and as you turn there, I'll pray for us one more time. Father, please bless Lord, the reading, the hearing, the understanding, the remembering, the application of your word to our lives. We pray that in a very real and special way that you would make yourself known in this moment, that you would be speaking through the Bible, through my words, to all of our hearts, to grow us up into the men and the women of faith that you want us to be. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 11 And I want you to think about a time in your life, maybe it's right now, where you feel overwhelmed. Maybe you feel like an outcast. Maybe you feel isolated. Some sort of hardship in your life and you feel like there's no hope, no end in sight. Seems to be going on without end and it's just going to go from bad to worse. We're going to look at a situation like that this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 11. And a little history lesson will help us maybe understand it and appreciate it even more. So if you went to the book of Judges, don't do that now, but you can do it later if you'd like a little extra study. I think it's Judges chapter 19 through 21, but it's at the very end of the book. There was a civil war, essentially, between many of the tribes of Israel. There were 12 different tribes that made up this nation, and one of the tribes, Benjamin. And, but there was this one city that didn't participate in the civil war. And they were not rewarded for that. They were kind of scorned for that. They were even punished for that. And so a little bit of history, also a little bit of geography will help you understand this situation. The nation of Israel primarily, then and now, sat between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Most of you could look on the map and find that. But there were a couple of tribes that when they were first settling, the nation of Israel said, we like this land on the far side of the Jordan. And we want to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. And they were allowed to, but they were a little bit more isolated from the other tribes. And that city that we're going to look at this morning that had been isolated, left out of by their own choosing, the Civil War, and they were scorned for it, they were on the other side of the Jordan. So geographically, historically, they had all these reasons to kind of feel like the outcast, to feel isolated. And I wonder if there are times and places in our lives where we feel the same way. And we're going to see some of the hardship that came on them. Start in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh-Gilead. That's the city that I was speaking of. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us, and we will serve you. So, one of their classic enemies, the Ammonites, come and they surround the city. And the men of the city of Jabesh feel like, We have no hope. <laughs> no, we're not even going to try to fight. So they just say, hey, What kind of terms of a peace, of a surrender would you give us? That's how hopeless they are. Sometimes we feel that way in life. Verse 2, but Nahash the Ammonite said to them, on this condition I will make a treaty with you that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. Now, this was not just random cruelty, but oftentimes in the ancient world, when you went into hand-to-hand combat, you'd have a sword typically in your right hand because most people are right-handed and you'd have a shield in your left hand and the shield would tend to cover your left eye. You couldn't really see well with your left eye. So if you wanted to be effective in combat, you needed your right eye to see who you were fighting. Also, maybe if you were shooting a bow, throwing a spear, you tend to use your right eye, your dominant eye to aim. And so what he was saying is, I'll make a treaty with you. You'll be my slaves. I'll leave you one eye so you can work for me. But I'll take the right eye of everybody else. And listen, there's historical evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This wasn't just a veiled threat that he had actually done this, that he had captured some Israelite soldiers before and put out their right eye. This is a real threat. But notice, this was not just him trying to protect himself. I don't want you guys to rise up in rebellion one day. Look at the last phrase of verse 2. And thus bring disgrace on all of Israel. He hated the entire nation of Israel. He's like, I don't want to just capture this one city. I kind of want to make a mockery of all the Israelites. I kind of want to boast in the fact that all the other 11 tribes, they couldn't come and help you, and you were left alone. And by gouging out every right eye of the city, I'll do that. A lot of times when we find ourselves in a position in life where we have power over other people, there's a very strong tendency to rise up in pride and to want to protect ourselves, even if that means hurting other people. Now, most of us don't have military power and we're not trying to take anybody's right eye out. But a lot of times we have social power. Maybe we have economic power. 
Maybe you're the boss of the company. Maybe you're the president of the fraternity. Maybe you're just the prettiest girl or the richest guy, whatever it may be. But we can tend to use all forms of power to disdain others, to look down on them, to kind of go the extra mile, to put a buffer, to protect ourselves, to protect our power. Verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. I mean, this was such a terrible deal. I mean, try to put yourself in their shoes. I'll let you live. But every person, man, woman, child, you're going to lose your right eye. And I'm pretty sure they weren't going to use any anesthetic. It was not going to be a fun process. So terrible. We don't have much hope. But let us send out messengers for a week and see if we can find help. And if not, we'll surrender. And Nahash was so arrogant, he was so sure of himself, he was so sure that this city was so isolated on the other side of the river, nobody would come to help. He's like, sure. I mean, it's almost like he's mocking them. Yeah, take seven days. I will relish the week of you trying your best to find help. No help's going to come. It's just going to make my mockery of you even sweeter. So the messengers go out, verse 4. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. So they go to the nation of Israel across the Jordan. They report it, and everybody else just weeps. It's terrible. But the attitude seems to be, we can't help you. There's not enough time and energy to unify the tribes, get an army up, go back and help you. We'll weep with you. It's really sad what's going to happen to your city and your families. It's terrible. Okay? Where in life do you feel stuck? Where in life do you feel hopeless? Where do you feel like in life, the only thing I can do is just lay down and just cry, just weep? I think a lot of Christians struggling with certain sins get to a point like this in their life. Pornography, drunkenness, tobacco, maybe other things, anxiety, where you just feel like, you know what, I've tried before, I've fought before, I don't feel like I'm making any progress, so I might just make a peace treaty with sin, just kind of give in, quit fighting it. But here's the thing. When you make a peace treaty with sin, it's always going to get worse. It's going to be like this. It's going to heap shame and condemnation on you. It's going to be like your right eye is going to get taken out. Don't ever give in. And praise the Lord, they didn't have to either. Okay. So look in verse 5. Now behold, Saul was coming from the, hill, from the field behind the oxen. And Saul said, what is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh. Now, we've looked at this great cause of weeping. I'll go ahead and skip to the end of the story. Israel's going to win this battle. But the reason they're going to win this battle, humanly speaking, is because of one spiritual leader. You may have heard in the announcements that this church is in a season of electing officers, elders and deacons, the spiritual leaders of this church. And there are different passages in Scripture that talk about what those men are supposed to be like. But this is a really great snapshot of a spiritual leader. So I want us to look at Saul in these next few verses is what is a spiritual leader supposed to be? And the first thing we see, he's humble. Okay, if you were here last week or if you're familiar with the book of Samuel, he had already been anointed to be king. He was crowned as king. And yet there were not many kingly duties to do for the new king. And so he just said, well, I'll go back to work. I'll go back to being a farmer. He was humble. He was also hardworking. He wasn't lazy. He didn't say, hey, why don't y'all get me some slaves to come in here and, you know, fan me and feed me grapes or something like that. He threw himself into the task. He's concerned. He's caring. He's compassionate. I know some modern-day people, I've been this way myself in the past at times, unfortunately. You see somebody else crying, and you're like, well, stinks to be them. Glad I'm not going through whatever they're going through. And just walk on by. But not Saul. He sees somebody weeping. He pulls over. What's going on? What's the problem? He's got compassion. Look at verse 6. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. Now, if you were here last year, we talked some about righteous anger. There is such thing as righteous anger. It is good to be angry at sin. It is good to be angry when other people are hurting and abusing other people in sinful ways. And Paul had, I mean, excuse me, Saul had this righteous anger, this zeal. Look at what he does in verse 7. He took a yoke of oxen, he cut them in pieces, and he sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. There was historical precedent when you wanted to unify the tribes for war to take a dead body 
and cut it up and send it out. And Saul does this. Okay? Now, he, there's so much that he's doing here this well. He's a leader. He's organized. He's got a plan. He's spiritually aligned. Did you notice? He said, I want you to come out and follow me and Samuel. Samuel was the prophet. He didn't try to say it's all about me as the leader. He said, no, me and Samuel, we're like one man. We're aligned. I'm a king that's aligned with Yahweh. I'm aligned with his prophet. And he's fair. He could have said, I remember when I was first reading this passage, I thought what it was going to say is, hey, if you don't come and follow me, what I did to this ox, I'll do it to you. He didn't say that. Okay? He's not a ruthless tyrant, but he did say, I'm the king. This would be like a draft. You've got to come and serve in the army, and if you don't, there's going to be consequences. He's a fair leader. Okay? Verse 8. When he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have deliverance. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. A real spiritual leader encourages people. He gives people hope. He gives them news that makes them glad. And, and just put yourself for a second in the shoes of the messengers. They had escaped. If they had doubt that Saul and the army was going to really deliver them, the smartest thing they could have done was said, hey, we're not going back. We don't want to lose our right eye. We got out. We're not going back. But they had so much faith and confidence in what Saul and the army was saying. They're like, we'll even go back into this besieged city so we can pass the message of hope. Verse 10. Therefore, the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. Verse 11, The next day Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and they struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. It's a rout. They probably showed up sometime between 2 a.m., 6 a.m. They surprised them, and they massacred them, the enemies of the Lord. He fights. He's a man of courage. He's a man of zeal. Okay? Now, what has happened is by this victory, in a sense, Saul has been confirmed as king. Some of you will be old enough to remember a presidential election. I think it was in the year 2000, and literally the country was almost split exactly down the middle. Not much has changed since then. And President George Bush won the electoral vote. He didn't win the popular vote. Literally, the election had to go all the way to the Supreme Court. It took weeks and maybe even months before it was finalized. But once 9-11 happened and there was a terrorist attack, and they started the call up to go to war in Afghanistan, at least in the early days, the country rallied around the new president. And in a sense, it was like, now he's finally confirmed as everybody's president. And in a sense, and I'm not trying to be political here, I'm trying to say this. That's a picture of what happened with King Saul. In the beginning, you might remember, there were some men, go back and read at the very end of chapter 10, that said, we don't think this farmer boy can be our king. He's not worthy. We don't think he can lead us into battle. Who is he? He can't do anything. They didn't honor him. They didn't give him the appropriate gifts you were supposed to give to a new king. But now that he's won the victory, it's like everybody is unified. Everybody trusts this new king because he's been confirmed by victory in battle. Look at verse 12. Then the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. Now again, this was a theocracy. Yahweh was the leader of this nation. And now the way he led the nation was through a king. So it's, it's a fair argument to say, if you despise the king of Yahweh, you despise Yahweh. If you're a traitor to the king of Yahweh, you're a traitor to Yahweh. And he has the right to execute you if he wants to because you despised him and disdained him. But look in verse 13. This may be the most spiritual leadership element that Saul has. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. This is a day that's about salvation for the people of God, not death and punishment. Okay? He's gracious. He's kind. He's forgiving. He's magnanimous. Verse 14. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. So they had already anointed Saul as king, but now it's like, let's bring the whole nation together and reaffirm what we have done when everybody's in agreement. Verse 15, so all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. 
There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. That was the only type of offering that when you made it, everybody, not just the priests, but the common people could eat part of the sacrifice as well. So this was really a feast. And there Saul and all the men of Israel greatly rejoiced. Now, there's a lot of application that we can take from here. If anything is going on in your life where you feel stuck, you feel hopeless, you feel overwhelmed, you feel like an outcast, maybe socially, maybe financially, I don't know, isolated, left alone, don't just go die on a pile of self-pity. Send out a messenger. The messenger could be prayer straight to God, or you may be at a place in a season in your life where you feel so weak and so distant from God, you're like, I don't even know if I believe in prayer anymore. God didn't answer any of my prayers. That's how I got here. Go to a Christian brother or sister, a peer that you trust because of their spiritual maturity. Maybe some of the characteristics you see in King Saul here. Maybe an elder, a leader, a mentor, a counselor, a pastor, and say, would you pray for me? Would you pray with me? Would you help me? The Christian life is not meant to be done alone. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian that will thrive. Ask for help when you're struggling. That, that, guys, is one of the biggest pieces of our pride and our arrogance, and I hope you hear my heart saying it with love when I say it, stupidity. That when we get into sin and struggles, we try to handle it on our own. It's just a guaranteed recipe to stay stuck. Light is a great disinfectant. Bring other people into the problem to help you, to pray for you. The second thing is I would say, if you are in any kind of spiritual leadership role, and I'm not just talking about an official role like an elder or deacon, you might be a single mom, you're a spiritual leader for those kids. You might be a new dad, you're a spiritual leader over your family. You might be the chaplain of your sorority, you're a spiritual leader for those people you're leading in Bible study. Any type of spiritual leader What I would encourage you to do is maybe later today, take this passage back out and just read through from verse 5 all the way down to verse 13. It's short and quick. And just prayerfully say, God, where am I weak? Maybe in some of the attributes of the spiritual leadership qualities that King Saul had. And would you grow me up? Would you help me be more that way? A great commentator named Matthew Henry said this, When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon men, it will make them expert without experience. You understand the point there? Listen, Ephesians 2.10 is a great verse. It says that we, all Christians, are God's workmanship, His craftsmanship, that we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works that He prepared in advance for us to do. Saul had been a farmer, and in a moment, he's turned into a great military leader. You may be thrust into some situation, you're like, I don't have the preparation. I didn't go to school for this. My daddy didn't raise me and teach me how to do this. But if it's something in front of you that God wants you to do, and you're prayerful and dependent, he will give you all of the strength and ability and know-how you need to do to be faithful. You may not be perfect. You may not be the best. But you can be faithful in what he has called you to do as you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And you ought to be praying for that. And the third thing I would say is this. Anytime, anywhere, you have any type of power in life over other people. But listen, this is a big topic in our culture right now. Power is not a bad thing. Power is a dangerous thing. Because it can go to our heads and we can want to abuse it and take advantage of other people. And so one of the things we ought to draw from this passage is any time and place that God has given you a measure of power in life over other people, make sure you steward it well, that you steward it humbly, that you steward it to bless them and not to burden them unnecessarily. Use your power to help people, not to hurt them as much as you realistically can. Now, to some degree, every single one of us, if we're paying attention, at some point in our life, We were in a place where we were stuck in sin. We were stuck in hopelessness. We cannot save ourselves. And we have all made peace treaties with sin. I mean, literally, you could say we've made peace treaties with Satan at times in our lives. That's what we're doing when we willingly give in to sin. We willfully choose to sin. And how does it always end, guys? There's pleasure in sin for a season, but it's never worth it. It brings more shame. It brings more condemnation. It brings more guilt. It brings a downward spiral. But the true king of Israel. Guys, we weren't smart enough. We weren't godly enough. We weren't mature enough to send a messenger to heaven and say, help us. 
That's how stuck in our sin we were. But because he's a gracious, sovereign God and he knows all things, he heard our cry. And he came down to help us. Even though we deserve punishment, we were true traitors. He could have wiped us out. Pure justice. He came to show mercy. And guys, he gave us peace terms. He gave us a peace treaty. But he wasn't going to take our right eye. He's going to give us spiritual eyes, spiritual light, spiritual heat, spiritual warmth, spiritual life. It's a glorious treaty. We really lose nothing of value and we gain everything. For this great deliverance that happened, somebody had to die. The enemies had to die. For our great salvation and deliverance, we should have died and suffered in hell forever. But the Lord Jesus Christ died in our stead. And when he rose again from the dead, that was his resurrection victory over death, hell, the grave, sin, and Satan, confirming him as king. He was already king. That just confirmed him as king. And guys, you know what really worship service is supposed to be every Sunday morning? It's like us coming together and having a spiritual feast together, worshiping the Lord for that great deliverance with excitement. Rejoicing. I mean, we could call this a rejoicing service. That's what true worship is supposed to be. A remembrance, at least on once a week, we come together and we rejoice before our great king because of the great deliverance that he has purchased for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good. You are so gracious. You were so wise. You were so humble. You were so generous. You were so magnanimous. Lord, you... You had every right to abandon us, to wipe us out. And yet you were willing to go to the cross and suffer the wrath of your Father and be wiped out, be abandoned for us. How great is your love. Lord, I pray if we are hearing and understanding that for the first time or for the one trillionth time, there would be a sweet and fresh sense of joy Lord, a sense of rejoicing, a sense of even laughter, that we wouldn't just be bored with the good old gospel story just because we've heard it so many times. Make our hearts sing. Lord, where we are weak and need grace and help, make us wise enough and humble enough to ask for help. Where we have power to help others, make us loving and kind and sacrificial enough to be ready and willing to help them. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.